Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you may be joining us. That's the fun part about this is that we, you know, we have people joining us really from across the world, all time zones, all geographic locations, uh, denominations, and that's what makes this interesting and fun. My name is Avi Stamen, and I'm the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Thank you for joining us. I believe this is our 17th publication success interview, um, and I've lost count, so I, I hope that's okay. Uh, during these interviews, I engage in conversation with really interesting, exciting, um, and innovative thought leaders in the world of academia about how they're influencing the world of academia in the hopes of building bridges between authors, um, and publishers, funding bodies, and all of the important um, <clears throat> individuals in the publication, in the academic publication uh, scene. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Beth Louie, uh, who's editor, who's an editor, consultant, and author of the book, Handbook for Academic Authors. Um, I think that by now, um, <clears throat> the book can be christened as, uh, as real, um, you know, Bible, uh, when it comes to academic writing. Um, and for those who have not yet read it, I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, some some have called it canon, so I would definitely um, encourage you to do that. As a career, After her career uh, as a book editor, Beth founded the Scholarly Publishing Program at Arizona State University, where she trained a new generation of university press and textbook editors. Um, in her workshops for aspiring authors, she's advised more than a thousand graduate students and faculty members on the best ways to get their work published. Her handbook for academic authors that we just mentioned is now in its sixth edition, that is correct, you heard it right, from Cambridge University Press and has been called a classic, candid, informative, and encouraging, and the most comprehensive resource on scholarly publishing available. Um, feel free to check in at any point uh, using the Zoom chat, and we'll try to answer any questions that you have. That's the point of making this a live session, is so that you can ask questions and we can engage. Um, most likely, we will try and address the majority of the questions at the end, but if there's something really pressing, we'll try to get to it as we have the conversation. Um, if you have a more personal question or want to discuss your specific research, you're welcome to reach out to me or to Beth following the, in the days following the interview. This interview is being recorded. I'm double checking. Yes, the recording is on. Good. Um, and it will be uh, sent out over the next few days. So if you want to go over any points at a later date, you want to share with any colleagues, you are more than welcome to do so. We invite you to do so. Um, before we get started here, um, I just want to quickly uh, share my screen and uh, just a quick plug. Uh, for my company, Academic Language Experts. Um, Academic Language Experts, uh, I founded uh, about eight years ago it, with the hope and goal of supporting authors on their journey to publication, whether it be through language services, so that's translation, editing, proofreading, or publication support. So that can be a grant proposal uh, suggestions and review. Uh, that can be academic coaching for scholars, for junior scholars who are looking for additional help. Um, and it's also with help getting your research out there after it's already been published. We work with um, prestigious institutions, scholars, and universities around the world. Um, so if you are looking for additional help with your grant proposal, with your book, with your article, don't hesitate to be in touch. As you can see, my email is right here on the screen. All right. That's enough of uh, the plug. My apologies. And all right. Um, <clears throat> So it's our mission to help authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. And now with great excitement and no further ado, I wanna introduce you to Beth. Beth, thank you very, very much for joining me today. It's an honor and pleasure of having you here in our virtual room. Thank you. So Beth, let's get started here. Um, maybe you can take us back um, a few years um, to the to your early year, early career as an editor and kind of, how that came about and what prompted you to go ahead and go from just being, I guess, you know, an editor who helped individuals to founding the scholarly publishing program. Well, um, I noticed that one of my former students is here today. And in case there's more than one, hello to all of you. Um, I started my career as an editor working for a foundation in New York City and we had teams of scholars from around the world um, who would contribute to multi-author volumes. And I would edit them, occasionally translate, um, and then we'd send them on to uh, commercial publishers. I learned how to be an editor by myself. Most editors at that time, and even now, are self-taught. 
And I spent an awful lot of time with the Chicago Manual of Style, too many evenings. And I always felt like if, if that I would have been a better editor and I would have become a better editor faster if I'd had some sort of systematic training. Um, and that's what I set out to provide when um, Arizona State gave me that opportunity. And I think my students' success um, tells me that my instincts were right. Got it. And, and tell us how you went from there to writing the Handbook for Academic Authors. I do want to hear, I want to hear two things. First of all is, what is the Handbook for Academic Authors? But more importantly, what were, what was the process that brought you to deciding that that's a book that needed to be written, that maybe was missing in the field, was an extension of your work with individual authors? And kind of how did that develop and, and come about? Well, when I joined um, the faculty at Arizona State and people found out that I'd been an editor, they would come into my office, they'd always close the door. And they'd ask me que questions about their projects. You know, who should I send it to? Or um, how do I do this? Or um, you know, how can I do something with my dissertation? And I thought, you know, my God, these people don't know anything. So <laughs> I thought, well, I'll just do kind of a, an FAQ. I'll do a little pamphlet. So I did that. And I um, gave it to a colleague to read. And I chose a colleague who I thought was really smart and a good critical reader, even though he had absolutely no tact. I knew that on his desk, he had a rubber stamp that said bullshit. So um, I gave it to him to read and he gave it back with this huge list of things that I should have put in, questions I hadn't answered. And by the time I answered all his questions, I had a book length manuscript. I love it. That's fantastic. That's a great story. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, you know, you said a lot of people came in and asked a lot of questions. I mean, I know it, it seems to me that there's sort of this unwritten rule or expectation that, that new, you know, junior academics that are starting in their career are just going to kind of learn on the way how to publish a book, publish articles, you know, do research. And there may be intro to statistics, right? Or there may be, you know, qualitative research, of course, but there's no one I've never at least seen like a university offer an intro to academic publishing and how that works. And, you know, there may be, you know, here or there sort of, but I think that maybe that's the issue. There's sort of this feeling on the behalf of junior researchers, like, oh yeah, of course I'm supposed to be expecting how to do this because I was born with this innate knowledge somehow. But actually in reality, um, and by learning it in, in an organized and, you know, and, and comprehensive way, we can save ourselves a lot of time and heartache making all the mistakes that others have made before us and then, you know, learning from our own mistakes. Well, one of the readers um, for Cambridge, in the first edition, who was a Brit and probably at Cambridge or Oxford, um, said there was no need for such a book. I mean, everyone knows that. Well, no. <laughs> Maybe everyone at Cambridge and Oxford knows it, although I doubt it. Um, but certainly most junior scholars and most senior scholars um, don't have a clue about how publishing works and how to take advantage of the ways that um, publishing works. Got it. So give us the 30 second elevator pitch um, for what is in, if I, if someone were to buy the handbook for academic authors, what are the top, what are, give us like a taster for some of the topics that they would be reading about within. And I know that it's gone through six editions and probably has developed and we'll talk about that, but you know, someone who let's say would buy the most recent edition, what exactly, what are the topics that you're covering there that like we said, maybe are not covered in, in, you know, kind of other settings. Um, how to, how to choose a publisher, whether it's a journal or a book publisher, and how to submit to that publisher, how to negotiate a contract uh, once you do have a publisher, how to get through all the mechanics of publishing, proofreading, indexing, finding illustrations, getting permission, how to help the publisher market your book if it's a book, um, and um, also to think about other kinds of books um, textbooks and um, books for general readers, not just monographs and things for other specialists. Got it. And, and 
you know, what, what remind, remind me, what year did the first edition come out? <clears throat> uh, 1987, I think. 1987. Okay. So I would register a guess that 99% of books that were published, academic books that were published in 1987 are collecting dust um, in the library, if not, <laughs> you know, all forgotten, you know, altogether forgotten. What do you credit? I mean, this has gone through six editions and is still kind of, you know, a hot ticket item. Um, what do you credit the longevity? And I, I, I'm probably giving away secrets here, but I was born in that same year. So it just comes to show you kind of <laughs> what that, um, you know, how long it's been around for us. So I can, I can do the quick math. Um, what has changed over, like, first of all, what do you credit the longevity to, but also what have you kind of had to, you know, take into account and change over the various editions over time? <clears throat> um, I think the reason that the book has lasted so long is that um, we're still not teaching people any of this stuff. That course doesn't exist yet. Um, also, there certainly hasn't been any reduction in the pressure on um, ju especially junior scholars to publish. Um, so that's still needed. And I think too that um, more academics are thinking about using their research in a more public way and wondering how they can um, communicate what they've learned to people who don't have the uh, specialized background of their peers. So I, I think that's, that's part of it. As for what has changed, I think um, there are about, I think there are four things, general things that have changed. Technology has changed greatly. Uh, when Cambridge published the first edition of my book, it was the first book that they had taken an author's discs and created the print volume from the discs in-house. They had never done that before. There was no email. Okay, I mean, if this is, I, I don't want to tell you how old you are, but it's a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm much older. Um, so technology has changed, uh, both in production and in dissemination. The economics of publishing has changed. Um, it's much harder to get a book published. There are a zillion more journals, but there aren't a zillion more good journals. They're just a zillion more journals. Um, so you have to learn to be more discerning than you used to. Um, we have open access is well on its way to um, making a huge difference in the way pub, um, the economics of publishing works. So that's two things. The third thing is that my audience has changed. When I um, published the first edition, my colleagues and my readers were almost all white men. There were not that many women in the academic world, especially outside the humanities. There were very few people of color. Um, it was, I think, exceptionally difficult for scholars in other in, um, countries outside um, the UK and um, United States and Canada to get their work published. Um, so there are just different people out there trying to do what I want to help them do. And finally, I've changed. Um, I found I was not happy with the tone of my earlier books. Um, I was a little too flippant. Um, and in this edition, I've tried to be much more um, sympathetic, understanding, um, and encouraging. Because I think um, with help and with effort, um, people can get their work published, and they, I don't want them to be too discouraged. That's why I start out the book with a, a rejection story. Hmm. Can, do you mind sharing a little bit about <laughs> that rejection story with us? Because I think that um, rejection is a bit of an elephant in the room sometimes. Yeah, um, it is. And a bit of a taboo. Um, and there's a feeling of, oh, if my research is rejected at any point, whether it's by my advisor when I'm working on my revisions of my dissertation or whether it's when I submit my first article or my first book proposal and thinking that that's a reflection on the quality of my research or on the quality of me as a researcher. 
So maybe sharing that can help, you know, some of us kind of grapple with that challenge. Okay, well, um, I thought I knew the perfect publisher for my book, and that's where I sent it. And I got within a couple of weeks, a form rejection letter. I was really insulted, um, but I then sent it out, sent a, um, not the whole manuscript, but a prospectus out to 12 different publishers, six university presses and six trade houses. And the next week I got a rejection from a trade house saying that great idea for a book, but it's really a university press book. And the very same day I got a rejection from a university press saying, oh, super idea, but you know, that's a trade book. Um, I got a couple more rejections and then I got a phone call from um, a man named Colin Day at Cambridge who was really enthusiastic, wanted to see the whole manuscript. Um, I mentioned that I was thinking of adding a chapter on economics and he said, oh, I'm an economist. I, I'd love to work with you on that. And um, that's where it ended up. Um, when the book came out, six months after the book came out, I got a rejection letter from Oxford. Um, I guess the editor was cleaning his desk. But the best thing was that after the book came out, I gave a talk about the book at the Association of University Presses meeting. And at lunch, I was seated next to the editor from that first press who had rejected my book. And she turned to me and said, I love your book. I wish we had had the chance to publish it. So that's what those rejection letters tell you. They tell you that it's very quirky, it's unpredictable, it has very little, to, unless 20 presses all reject it, it's not you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's like so many great nuggets from that story that we can <clears throat> pull out and sort of focus on, you know, the fact that you First of all, spread the net wide. I think that's an important lesson and not saying, but it, putting all of our hopes into kind of one place and saying it's this or nothing. Um, second of all, how to sort of take rejection and understand that this is not a rejection of me or my ideas, but when looking at the long run, you know, the long run and saying, I know this has merit, I know this has value. It's just a matter of someone recognizing that. Um, and also adjusting ourselves and adapting ourselves to figuring out, okay, can I judge based on the response? This is something I tell authors a lot. Can I can I judge based on their response what they did or didn't like about it? Can I even even be a little bit more have a little bit more gall and turn around and say, do you mind sharing with me what it was that didn't you know fit with what you're trying to do so that I can learn from it? Um, and like you said, you know, it's a matter of finding the right home. You know, just like um, you know, um, we're, we're, we try. You know, it, it, not everyone needs to fall in love with it. It's just a matter of one who is enthusiastic, who gets excited about it. And that's enough to, you know, kind of propel it forward. Um, in your case, you know, obviously a very nice prestigious publisher and that's, you know, so, 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 so no shame there. Now I do want to jump into, I want to get into a bit of the nitty gritty. Cause I think that, that that's what a lot of folks are here to hear about, like, you know, some really hands-on, on tips. So, um, I want to kind of take, frame a situation which is um which which i see a lot and i think that probably many of our uh, attendees today are in this sort of you know transition period whereby they've either just finished writing their doctorate or are you know in the midst of writing their doctorate and are sort of have to answer to their advisor that or the you know or the committee um that's that's reviewing their 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 doctorate and that's kind of who they need to prove their understanding novelty worth to. And then all of a sudden making this sort of sharp transition, sometimes with the same materials or similar materials to whether it's a book publisher or an academic journal. And, 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 and sometimes they find that transition quite difficult. So can you try and identify for us kind of what are the main differences in approaching our relationship with our advisors versus our relationship with you know, external publishers and what shifts in mindset and approach scholars should take when making that transition? Yeah, um, I think one way to think of this is to go back to the journalists' um, classic questions. Who, who is your audience? You know who the audience is for your dissertation, but who's the audience for your article or your book? 
Is it people in your very narrow subspecialty? Is it people in a broader field? Is it policymakers? Is it students? Because you really need to know who your audience is before you can start to think about what you're going to do with the material. Then what? What form is it going to take? Is it going to be one article, several articles, a monograph, an op-ed essay? Um, lots of things it can be. It can be more than one of those things. Where should it appear? In which journal? or from which book publisher? Um, when do you have to get it done? If you're under a strict deadline, you need to take that into account. Um, is your work time sensitive? If you sit on it too long, is it gonna be out of date? Um, and then finally, why are you writing? Are you writing because you have to? Um, or is it to get crucial information to people who need it, to practitioners? Is it to change people's minds about an issue? Why are you doing this? So I, th I think that's a good place to start. And I think once you've answered those questions, um, you should have a pretty good idea of where you're headed and you can think about how to get there. Yeah, and, and I mean, everything you said, I, I, I totally sign off on and I would add that not only is it good for yourself as an author to have clarity so that you know exactly what your purpose is, it actually helps you sell the book um, to the publisher because the publisher can tell in your prospectus, in your proposal, does this individual have a clear understanding of who's going to be their readership? Because in the end of the day, for the publisher, they're making, in addition to a, you know, a, a de determination about the quality, the rigor, the, the value of the book, they're also making a determination about the, the economics of it and can they sell it um, very, very bluntly. So if you can clearly delineate who is the audience, um, you know, what are, like you said, is it policymakers? Is it, you know, um, fellow academics? Is it students? Can it be used as a textbook? That helps them to kind of figure themselves out and, and say, is this something that I can, you know, kind of fit into a specific um, uh, area that, that they already specialize in. Now, I want to I want to follow up on one thing that you mentioned, which is kind of what for, what what form it should take and specifically the debate, the decision between um, taking a dissertation and, and turning it into a book versus taking your dissertation, and turning it into a series of articles. And I'm curious if you know, you can share any insight you have as to how to go about making that decision um, <coughs> about what to do, you know, kind of how to um, rework your dissertation, what to turn it into. Well, the, the first thing I would say about reworking a dissertation is um, don't do it right away. You know, you've, you've written, you've turned it in, you've defended it. You're really tired of it. Unless you're unusual, you're really tired of it. You don't want to look at it. So don't look at it. Put it on the shelf. Um, maybe think about starting another project or get ready for a new class you have to teach or write a grant proposal. Do almost anything but work on that dissertation. Um, then when you go back to it and you've gone through those five questions I suggested, um, you can think about how to reach that audience. So if your audience is fellow scholars in a fairly narrow subfield, probably you're gonna write journal articles. And you generally, I think um, most dissertations can turn into one big journal article that you wanna get into the top journal, if you, a really top journal if you can, but then there's gonna be other stuff left over that you can make smaller articles out of. Um, you don't want to duplicate what you're saying. Um, one thing that um, journal publishers sometimes talk about, they use different terms for it, but it's essentially self-plagiarism. People who use the same material over and over again. Like you really can't get away with that anymore because um, it's so easy to find, detect um, on the internet. So, don't think about reusing, think about separating pieces out um, that may have some overlap, but are distinct um, projects. Um, if you're in a field where you have to publish a book, 
your dissertation probably is the best place to start because you've done the research, but it's going to take a lot of work to get from the dissertation to the book. Um, and um, we can talk about that more if you like. Yeah, let's 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 go, let's go for it because um, I think that's <laughs> that's a really big challenge that people have because they they've done all this work on their dissertation and they've got three hundred fifty pages of you know well researched scrutinized, scrutinized you know criticized um, reviewed research and then it's like okay well why wouldn't the publisher just want this um, so what what are some of the moves and some of the you know um, I, I guess I'll ask again, my, both mindset wise, but also in terms of content that differentiate between a dissertation or between, a, you know, doctoral work and a book and what's kind of like it, maybe you could help us by like breaking it down into a step. If I have my dissertation, let's say approved and ready to go, how would you advise to go about the process of converting it to become, uh, you know, a book that has potential with a major um, either university or trade publisher? Well, first of all, let's go back to audience. Your committee read your dissertation because that's their job. Um, in fact, I, I have students who will tell you that not all the committee members actually read it. <laughs> but in theory, they read it and they did it because they had to. Now you've got an audience that has to choose to read your book. So you have to make it interesting, you have to make it appealing, and you've got publishers who want that audience to be big. Now, by big, I don't mean thousands of people, but a thousand would be nice. Um, and at least 500, they're gonna expect. So that may mean thinking about how to expand your topic. So I think the process of revising a dissertation goes in two directions. One is expansion, making your topic more general or um, just slightly expanding it. And the other is retraction, getting rid of the stuff that you had to put in because your committee wanted it. Remember, a dissertation is an academic exercise. You're proving that you've read what you should read, that you know the methodologies, that you should know, even if they didn't really apply to the, your project, you had to demonstrate that you know how to do them. You had to read and talk about stuff that turned out not to be really very important. Um, you may have had one committee member who just thinks that this topic, this little topic is incredibly important and you should spend a chapter on it, but it doesn't really fit. Um, there's just a lot of stuff in there that has to go the literature review. Your new audience assumes that you've done your reading. They assume that you know how to do a survey if you've done a survey. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to be defensive. You're a member of the club now. And you, you know, you can, you don't have to prove all that stuff. The scary thing about the getting rid of is there may not be much left. But that's where the expansion comes in. If you want, suppose you're a French, an 18th century French historian. How can you get the 19th century folks in without too much effort? Or maybe the 18th century German or British historians. How can you expand in that way? Um, is that possible? Do you want to do it? How do you want to do it? It's really an opportunity to make your dissertation more interesting to more people and maybe even more interesting to yourself. I've actually never thought about it that way, Beth, as like a way to free yourself of the constraints of what you had to do in the context of your, you know, working with your advisors. And I really love that because I think that sometimes this, this, this is true for scholarly journal articles as well. Sometimes, you know, we feel like we have to put something in because they said it. What I love about book publishing and I actually think that we could use a little bit more of this in other contexts as well, is that you actually work with the acquisitions editor to um, try and get the best output possible, but they, you know, hopefully are respecting your autonomy and your authority as the, you know, a, 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 as really the, you know, the leading voice about where they should go. Obviously it goes through review, but the acquisitions editor, if it's the right fit and if they're excited about your project kind of works as an advocate for you. So one of the things that I would say to add on to what you were saying is 
get them involved early. It doesn't mean that you necessarily need to, you know, give them the whole, you know, don't dump the whole dissertation on their desk and say, yeah, I'm planning on doing something with this, but, you know, read through the 350 pages and then let me know whether you're interested. That's not going to work. But if you can come up with a compelling proposal, even before you've written the entire book, and then you can send it, you can, you know, try and identify, and maybe we can talk about that momentarily, how to identify which publishers, but you can identify a few big, you know, important publishers that you think are relevant, then actually you can get feedback in an early stage. And that gives you certain direction when you are revising, editing, expanding everything you said prior, um, that it actually is on target and it's heading in the right direction as opposed to, I feel like this is what I should be doing, but I'm not really sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And in fact, um, I've often suggested that when people, whether it's a, a revised dissertation or a new project, come up with like a one to two minute <laughs> description of the project, go to your, um, the meeting of your society, find a dozen, two dozen editors who are sitting at their booths and say, you know, I'm thinking about uh, you know, this project, give them the two minute speech. And if they're nodding off or turning to the next person, you know it's not a good idea. But if they, if you get even five or six of them to say, hey, you know, I'd like to hear more about that, then you know you're on the right track. Yeah, 100%. And the nice part about books is that, you know, the power is sort of in the author's hands to pick and choose as opposed to with articles where you kind of have to submit it to one place and wait to hear back. <clears throat> with books, the tables can be turned. So if you're strategic about it and know how to find people that could potentially be interested, you can actually, um, you know, help your own bargaining power. So let's talk about that for a second. How do you recommend going about the process of actually identifying which publishers could potentially be interested? You know, I get a lot of scholars come to me and say, well, I need blue chip, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, you know, Princeton, because that's what I need. And without really kind of asking themselves the question, well, do they have an interest in your field, in your topic area? So how do you recommend going about the process of sort of winnowing through the, I don't know, dozens, if not hundreds of academic presses that are out there in order to find the five, six, seven, or eight that could be potentially most excited or, or energetic about working with you on your proposal? Um, I'd start by looking at your bookshelf. See who's publishing the books that you read and, and look at the books critically. You know, are, are they the best in your field? Are they at least good? You've probably got books on your shelf in your field that you don't think are all that great. So you put those off to one side. Um, then go to the website and look at their current list and their forthcoming titles, because sometimes a publisher decides that a field isn't bringing in enough money, frankly, not getting enough readers. Um, and they're, they're not very active in that field anymore. So make sure your information is up to date. Um, and if, uh, if your bookshelf isn't enough, look at your bibliography, see where, see where the books are being published. Um, think about whether you want a university press or um, a uh, commercial publisher. There are advantages to each. The problem with commercial publishers is um, that they're not all reputable. Um, they may say they use peer review, but in fact, they don't. Um, and so at that point, it's probably a good idea, especially if you're a junior scholar, to talk to your department chair, um, to the senior people in your department and say, you know, what do you think of such and such a publisher? And um, if they kind of, of course, if they've published with them, that's helpful. But um, if they haven't and they don't have a good opinion of them, then you're better off looking somewhere else. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. And I always, I always tell scholars, you know, we tend to, to skip to the table of contents when we open up a book, but actually just start paying attention as you start reading to the publisher and the, you know, the boring first pages, um, because that can give you a tip off of not only what books are being published, but what series are out there. Um, mm -hmm. because if you can figure out not only, okay, I can come to Cambridge, I can come to Rutledge, I can come to Braille with an idea, but actually I already know which series they, you know, it could potentially fit into. So they might, they may or may not buy that, but it shows that 
you've taken the time to pay attention to what they're working on. And it, and, and it sort of continues the, the way I put it is always try and continue a conversation, right? Meaning your, 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 your research doesn't exist in a vacuum. So if you're relating to previous books that have been published, there's a really, you know, it's a big win to, for the publisher to be able to say, we're just continuing what we've already done, which means that we're engaging in dialogue and conversation, which is really can be dynamic, but also it's really easy for us to sell because we just go back to the same list that we built for the last book. Obviously, everyone's research is unique. Obviously, we have to be doing something novel within our research. But in terms of the audience, if we can continue an existing debate, discussion, doesn't mean we need to agree. Sometimes it's even more interesting if we're coming to critique something that's being done. But the same people are going to be interested. That can really kind of help us get, get something off the ground. Um, can you... Can you say maybe another word or two about the distinction between, aside from the predatory, you know, world of commercial presses, and, and I think it's important to distinguish between the really reputable ones that are trade commercial presses and the university ones. Are there other sort of important things to pay attention to in terms of the difference between those two categories? Well, um, look at how their books are priced, because that tells you how they see the market. If the books are really expensive, and by expensive, I mean like the ebook is 60 bucks um, and the hardcover is well over 100. And even the paperback is inching its way toward 100. That tells you they're planning to sell to libraries and they're not going to sell a lot of books. There are only 300 research libraries that buy all academic books. Um, if a press wants, thinks that there's a market for your book to individuals, they're gonna price it much lower. So look at the pricing. Um, if possible, talk to other authors who've published with them, see what their experience was and whether they would go back to them. Um, but um, in general, I, I think you often get a feel just from your correspondence with an editor, um, especially if it's email and it goes back and forth quite a bit. Um, you'll, you'll have a, a good sense. Also, look at the books themselves. If a book is poorly edited, you, you'll see that. You know, if it's full of typos, if it's redundant, if the index sends you to pages that aren't there, um, somebody's been really sloppy. You know what, Beth? I'll tell you that, unfortunately, I've seen really sloppy work, even with some of the big names. Um, you know, I, I think... That statement was 100% true 20 years ago, 50%, you know, 90% true 10 years ago. And it's unfortunately a slippery slope there. That doesn't mean that publishers aren't, you know, aren't putting, producing good, good works. I think they are as a whole, but I think that there's sort of this trend to offload some of anything that they can onto the authors, which is part of the reason to be frank that we have a business um, is that mm -hmm. the publishers have decided we don't want to be working on editing. We don't want to be working on formatting or indexing. We don't want to do any of that. Um, the authors should figure out how to do it on their own, um, that it, it sort of left this kind of gaping hole and a need for, um, you know, external services to, to come in and help. But, but you know, that lack of internal oversight has led to sort of a decline in, you know, some of those areas. So a lot, a lot, there can even be great variance within a series because when the auth some of the authors take their own sort of work very seriously and will make sure that it's really top notch and others may not be able to, not be able to afford to, or not be aware of um, some of the, you know, um, some of the shortcomings. So anyway, it's, um, I, I agree that in general, you know, the more serious publishers are putting in more time and effort, but I've been disappointed <laughs> recently with a few things that I've seen even for well, reputable publishers. That brings up another, another thing that um, authors might want to think about. Um, you're going to get a contract if you're lucky. Um, and most people turn right to the royalties. How many, you know, what am I going to get in royalties? Well, if it's an academic book, you're not going to get much, so don't worry about that. Um, what you should look at is what the publisher expects you to do. As Avi said, you're going to have to do the index, or you're going to have to hire someone to do the index. Uh, you're going to have to proofread, or you're going to have to hire someone to proofread. If you have illustrations, you're gonna to have to pay for those and you're gonna to have to get permission um, to use them. So make sure, you, you know, I, I had a, a colleague come to me and said, 
my textbook publisher went out of business. What's going to happen to my book? I got bought by somebody else. So well, what does your contract say? Well, I don't know. I haven't read it. You, know, you wouldn't buy a refrigerator without reading the contract or a car. So read the contract, understand what you're responsible for, and figure out what you can negotiate with the publisher. Um, not much, probably, but, but you'd be surprised. Well, I think the more excited the publisher is about the project, the more room there is for negotiation as well. And I think that's sort of maybe something that as academics, we're not so comfortable with. We're not, you know, the, 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 the haggling or the bargaining. And but but, you know, I think there's an expectation on the on behalf of the publishers that you are going to come and, and, and you know, make requests. And, and, and I think that's very reasonable. So don't be afraid to do that. And if they say no, they say no. And you know where their you know, end line is. But, you know, it, it, it can't hurt. It definitely can't hurt to try. Um, now, I want to I want to kind of circle around back around to the issue of, you know, writer's block, which I think is talked a, a lot about in the literary um, context. But I don't know if it's really it's, again, there's a lot of elephants in the room and things that we don't like to talk <laughs> about at academia. This is another one of them of people feeling like they're just stuck with their writing or that it's a very isolating process. And I think that's specifically true you know, the, the more we're working on our own, so this is especially true in humanities, sometimes in social sciences, maybe a bit less in, in the, you know, hard sciences, because it's more of a collaborative effort. But this feeling of just isolation, and I'm like, and like, I don't know whether what I'm doing is, is right, is wrong, is in the right direction, is not in the right direction. Um, and I don't think it's something that many of us feel comfortable talking about with, even with our peers, and definitely not in public. So can you, maybe share some thoughts and insights that you have about, you know, working with writers and, and how to, you know, how prevalent are these feelings and maybe some ways of kind of, and, or resources to overcome them and to, to, to battle through? Well, first of all, genuine chronic writer's block is a real thing. And if you have it, you need to get professional help from a psychologist or a counselor of some kind. But what most of us call writer's block um, is just aversion to writing or being stuck in one place in your work or procrastination. Um, and the cure for that is, according to the author of Peyton Place, applying the seat of your pants to the seat of your chair. So writing is hard. Uh, it's much harder than most of the other things we do every day. And there are ways to make it easier. The best way to start to make it easier is to do it every day. Maybe 15 minutes, half an hour, build up to an hour a day. Um, and it doesn't need to be your big project that you spend that time on. It can be writing a grant proposal, a peer review report. Just make sure that you're sitting down and writing. We all think that we don't have that hour a day. I waste an hour a day easily, and I bet you do too. Uh, there's an hour there somewhere. So you choose a time of day and a place <laughs> where you're not interrupted. Now, if it's a problem of being stuck at one place in your writing, just go somewhere else. Leave that place, and the puzzle will clear itself up later on. Um, and Another solution, there's, there's some mechanical tricks. Um, I like to think of headings that are going to go in my chapter. They may not end up there, but just they'll provide a roadmap for my writing. That might help you. Um, one of my journalist friends said, when you finish a writing session, go on to the next paragraph and stop in the middle of the sentence. So when you come back to the manuscript, you can pick it up right away. You're not facing a blank page. Um, try changing media. If you're working at your computer and you're stuck, <coughs> go pick up a pen and, pen and paper. Try writing that way. Try dictating. Um, as far as isolation goes, I'm a big fan of writing groups. Not huge writing groups, but small writing groups. Um, maybe once a month where you meet to talk about your writing. Um, you have to choose your companions carefully. Don't choose the competitive ones who want to always be far ahead of where you are or want to brag about their latest acceptance letter. 
choose people who are really eager to help one another. And they don't need to be in your field because what you're talking about in this group is not so much the content of your writing, but the process and the actual um, the issues that come up with writers, no matter what their field is. Got it. Um, I want to remind everyone, I mean, there's just so many, so many helpful tips, tips and tricks here, Beth, that you're providing us. I want to remind everyone that um, please do ask questions. I mean, this is a really unique opportunity to kind of pick Beth's brain. And I'm sure that people have a lot of ideas stewing through their heads. Um, but, you know, um, you know, go ahead and ask because we'll have time for, for Q&A at the end. And that's, that'll be really helpful. Um, Beth, I want to, I, this is, I, I think we'll wrap up with this question. Um, uh, you know, and if we have a bit of time at the end, maybe we'll throw another question or two in, but I'm wondering, I, one of the issues that I get asked about a lot or that I, um, that it's very challenging uh, for authors who are trying to turn their book, it, their dissertation into a book, or even more so with articles, is the cutting process. It's like cutting off live skin. That's kind of how I, <laughs> I, I feel about it uh, for many of these authors, because they have worked so darn hard to, you know, do the research and everything's important, right? How could anything not be important? And I think that process of you know, sort of going in and taking a hatchet and saying, okay, um, you know, actually big parts of this aren't going to be able to make it to the final screen um, can be quite a traumatic experience. So how do you recommend going about that process of, of cutting and, 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 you know, contraction that you, that you talked about before? Well, first I would say, don't make yourself throw anything out. Put it in a different file save it away somewhere, you may find a use for it. So it makes it a little easier to get rid of if you're not totally getting rid of it. Um, but for me, it's kind of like hoarding. Um, I always have to ask myself why I don't want to part with something. Um, sometimes it's, it's a really, really good story. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really make the argument move along. It doesn't help. So, okay, I'll set it aside. Maybe I can find somewhere else to use it. Um, sometimes it's because it took me like days to find this little tiny nugget of something. And in the end, that little tiny nugget isn't really important, but I worked so hard to get it. You know, okay, acknowledge you did work really hard. Give yourself a gold star and put it in that other file. Um, and sometimes you want to include something just because it shows how smart you are <laughs> or what a great sentence you can write and, you know, pat yourself on the back, give yourself that gold star and take it out. It's, um, it, it, the important question is always, does this advance my argument? Does it clarify my thinking for the reader? Um, and at the word level, I mean, sometimes um, you get a, a writing assignment where you have to limit the number of words. And how painful is that? Well, um, the uh, fiction writer, George Saunders, talks about how he does it. He says he has um, an inner nun. I think she was his English teacher at some point. And she sits on his shoulder and she says, do you really need that word? Do you really need that sentence? Take it out and see what happens. And by the time he's done, he's lost 75% of what he initially wrote. Um, so, you know, reread Strunk and White, where it tells you omit needless words. Um, it, it can be done, um, but we tend to cherish our, our words. <laughs> even if they're not absolutely charming for other people, sort of like children, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can personally relate. There's definitely been times where I'm like, this sentence is just written so well, even though it's not, you know, yeah. even though it's sure, I'm sure it's not necessary. I, we, we, you know, we've got to, I've got to find a way to incorporate it. But I, I like your idea of carving out. I, I find that the scholars that we work with that really are prolific, and I'm not a fan, by the way, of, publishing as much as possible, but that seems to be the kind of 
you know, default is that the quantity matters, um, at least in the current evaluation system. Um, the scholars who can figure out how to kind of take out those little pockets and think creatively about how to publish them. So sometimes we get into this mindset of book, journal, book, journal, but well, journals actually have different things that you can publish. You can publish a note, you can publish a review, you can publish all sorts. There are different creative ways to publish. And oftentimes I try to advise scholars, you want to get into a really top journal, but you're kind of young and junior, don't go for the main manuscript. Think about other ways you can get into the journal that sort of open up, a, you know, it's shoving your foot in the door and figuring out a way to kind of get in there and get your name out there. And then you can use that as leverage that later on in your career. So don't look at it as like a lost opportunity. Actually think about it as like flip it on its head and make it into a new opportunity that you might not have had otherwise. So which I think could be a really great way to look at it. Um, Beth, we could, I feel like we could make a five part series out of this, but I, I, <laughs> I want to respect people's time. Um, so we do have some questions that came in, but before we do that, uh, just a quick plug I put in here uh, for the upcoming uh, we have got uh, some really great, it's like a packed summer. I always say to myself that we should do a break over August and then I never do it. Um, so we've got events coming up over the next three months. Um, we've actually got a hybrid event coming up in uh, two weeks. Um, it's for, it's going to be at the, it's actually going to be taking place live at the um, Congress of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, but also being uh, also online. So you're welcome to join it no matter where you are. Um, and it's cutting the time to publishing your book in half with two editors from Brill. So that should be really interesting. We're going to talk about kind of what are the, just go into like very basic, what are the stages of publishing a book and why does it take so long? And does it have to take so long? Um, uh, I will give away the ending. No, it does not have to take as long as it does. And if you actually work organized, once you do have that initial interest, you can get a book out in six months, a year, if you're working organized, but it can take three, four years if you're not. So this is kind of a deep dive into that. Um, at the end of the month, uh, we're actually gonna be talking about the business of writing. Um, I know that, you know, Beth mentioned that oftentimes the royalties at work, almost always the royalties of academic writing um, are quite minimal. And I had a friend who used to, you know, show me his pay stubs that he got from the publisher at five, $6 a month. And we used to have a good chuckle about it together. But it is no laughing matter that there are academics who have managed to expand their reach and their say, and there are the Yuval Noah Hararis of the world who have taken their research and made it into literally a multi-million dollar project. Not that that should be everyone's goal, but it is feasible, it is doable to, you know, think about the business side of your book and 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 I don't think it should be totally ignored. So we're gonna be talking about that at the end of the month. Um, and then uh, more on the sort of, I would say emotional or, you know, side of writing, uh, we're going to be talking about ditching the negativity and transform your relationship with writing with Jane Jones, who's a writing consultant um, uh, in the U.S. So um, I encourage you to uh, attend uh, any or all of those. You can also go back into our archive and find uh, the 16 previous interviews that we've done. Um, I, I highly recommend. Um, aside from that, anyone who wants to follow up um, is welcome to do so. Um, Beth has been kind enough to uh, share uh, her contact info here. You can check out some of the resources on her website. Highly encourage you to check out the book, Handbook for Academic Authors. If you haven't already, um, you can send her an email. Um, if anyone is wants to reach out to me um, about anything we've discussed today or any of the services that we offer, you're also welcome to do so and check out our website um, in your uh, free time. So <clears throat> definitely go ahead uh, and uh, encourage you to register for our upcoming events. Okay. Um, I'm going to try, we're going to, we're going to try something new that I've never done before and I may regret it, but you know, if you don't try new things, you don't learn. Um, would anyone who has a question, who's asked a question actually like to say their question? I feel very uncomfortable that I'm always reading people's questions in their name. So Alfreda, thank you. Um, please do go ahead and ask yourself. I would, I, it, it makes me feel much better when, when you do it than I do it for you. Okay. Thank you. I hope that everyone can hear me. Yes. Um, my question is, how many publications annually would you recommend for a doctoral student in the humanities? Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not sure I understand how many. Uh, how many publications? Um, the thing about, the question that I have is I used to try to publish like one or two and then I'm trying three or four. I, I don't, I, I, I want to know what you would recommend. Okay, because I, I also think, have pieces I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the most important thing is to know what is expected of you in your department <coughs> and, and aim for that. Um, 
And even those, sometimes those are sort of definite numbers. You must have X um, articles to get tenure, or you must have a book and X articles. Um, but you need to talk with your um, department about what kinds of articles they're thinking of. I mean, do they count book reviews, for example? Or if you got one article in the lead journal in your field, would that count double? It sounds silly to, you know, to be that nitpicky, but they're gonna be that nitpicky. So just make sure you're all picking the same nits and that you understand what they want, because um, it varies enormously from department to department, field to field. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, Carolyn, do you want to do you want to share your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is that I'm at the point where I have let my dissertation rest for a while, and now I'm ready to start working toward publication. And I think I'll probably end up with a few journal articles. So I really appreciate the suggestion to answer those five questions about audience and purpose. But what other advice do you have for someone at my stage? I'm, I'm particularly worried about how to divide my chapters up into separate articles. Well, um, it may not work that way. I mean, maybe it, it depends a lot on your dissertation. Sometimes um, a chapter turns into an article, but sometimes an article kind of takes bits and pieces from many chapters. You may have an overriding theme that turns into one big important article and then other things become less important things, less important articles or less major articles. Sometimes a dissertation is exactly what you're describing. For example, if you've done a study of you know, six different authors writing about uh, a given theme, um, it would, to me, that would say, okay, one big article about the theme, six smaller articles maybe about the authors or maybe three articles you know grouping the authors in some way you know, without knowing the dissertation it's hard to say but don't automatically assume that a chapter becomes an article be a little looser about how to deal with the material thank you thanks anyone else who asked a question wants to um wants to share it with us you can just use the little raise hand um, feature in the um, in Zoom or. All right, so I'll go ahead and ask um, if, if I don't hear see see anyone chiming in, um, I'll go ahead and ask um, at what stage in the process is a contract usually offered? Um, that varies if, um, if you, <clears throat> sometimes uh, a publisher will offer you a contract on the basis of a prospectus. They really are interested, and they think that you know you can you're doing something wonderful, and they want to get it before somebody else does. You may get a contract at that point. It will still be contingent on peer review um, and on the editorial committee, but they may offer you a contract at that point. Other times, you won't get a contract until the book has been through peer review and has been to the faculty committee. It depends on um, the publisher and on um, how eager they are to have the book. Yeah. One thing that didn't come up, which I just want to mention briefly, is that, you know, sometimes scholars are worried that we did it, you know, if they, let's say, don't, um, you know, that, that, that publishers might not be interested in dissertations. And I heard a really interesting insight from an acquisitions editor recently who told me, on the one hand, it can work against you if you show that you're not organized and you don't really understand how the game is played. And then they see it's a dissertation. It's like, oh, well, it's going to be more work, even if you've already turned it into a book yourself, you know, and there's sort of a downside there. But she's she the same acquisitions editor mentioned to me that there's actually an upside in that if they think that you have potential and they are excited about you, they may grab you because they don't want other publishers kind of finding out, right? And they want to be the first in because once you publish your first book there, then maybe you can continue with them and doing other things with them. So don't automatically assume that because you're this is the first time they're going to it, you know, inherently like or dislike. Um, it actually depends on how you present yourself and how compelling what you're doing is. You know, in certain ways, someone who's already published five, six be, uh, books before 
they know more or less, you know, creative scholars hopefully are writing about new things, but they know or less kind of what their writing style, what they're, but if you're new, unique, have a different way of approaching things that can work to your advantage if you position it in the right way. Um, I want to, let's, let's take one more um, question. And then again, I'm sorry, we can't get to everyone. I just want to keep to time. Um, <clears throat> David uh, raised his hand, David. Thank you. So having finished my doctoral study, I no longer have free access to online academic publications, uh, which I would need to update my dissertation research for publication. Do publishers ever help to provide such access? Hmm. I don't know that they do, um, but I do know that, for example, JSTOR, and I believe, um, uh, the, the other big journal, which I can't think the name of, right? journal collection that I can't think of the name of right now, do offer um, fairly reasonable access to individuals. Um, another possibility is, depending on what state you're in, sometimes state universities um, can provide access um, to um, online sources to state residents. Um, so, and your public library may even have um, JSTOR, ProQuest, some of the other services. So um, also, wherever you got even your undergraduate degree, sometimes they'll provide um, uh, access, sometimes for a small fee, to alumni. So I would shop around a bit um, and see if you can. I, I still use um, Arizona State Access, even though I haven't been there for uh, 15 years. Um, so give it a try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and there are sort yeah, they're, they're saying in the comments here, there are, there are all sorts of, um, you know, groups out there that kind of where people help each other out with, with materials and sources. Um, you can also always turn to the author themselves. Um, all right, we've got a lot of additional questions here, but I am going to end things here. I apologize for everyone who didn't, didn't get questions too. I think a lot of these questions probably, um, you know, you can reach out to um, to myself or to uh, Beth. Um, and uh, I will say that, you know, Nazi, Nazli is specifically asking about publishing in other languages. That's something that I can definitely um, address. Uh, uh, personally, I'm sorry that we, I, I just want to make sure that we kind of hold to our uh, time limits and, and, and Beth's, um, you know, kind, great, being gracious with their time. So thank you, Beth, for joining us. Um, it was really a pleasure having you. Um, thank you to everyone who came. Um, we really, um, you know, it's great to kind of see some old faces, but also a lot of new ones, which is really great. Um, and, uh, you know, there was just, there was so much, you know, golden nuggets in this, in this, in this one, Beth. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to seeing everyone at the next event. Bye for now.